All right, officially, good morning. Nice to have everyone here this morning. Um, I do have a few announcements to get us started, uh, but if anyone has any, come on up and uh, you can share those as well. I think we have a picture to share in just a moment here. Uh, the youth wanted to share a picture. Um, they were at uh, the FCA, I think that's the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, is that the event? Okay. Uh, FCA worship service at Concord High School. They said it was a wonderful night of fellowship and testimony. So it looks like a good group there. Was that just Friday night here or Wednesday night? Okay. All right. Very good. All area youth. Okay. Great. Glad you could attend. Um, on our agenda today, uh, coffee kitchen is available after service. So um, thank you to those that set that up this morning. And at 1030, uh, we have Sunday school for all ages. Uh, this week, Wednesday, 5.30 is Awana, 6 is Youth, and 7 is the Adult Bible Study. And next Sunday, we do have the church carry-in after Sunday school at 11.30, and then the church council meeting to start at 12.45. Uh, reminder also, next Sunday is Food Pantry Sunday, so if you have any um, items to bring in for that, um, please bring those Sunday. Any other announcements before we get started this morning? If not, we will uh, invite the light into the sanctuary and we will listen to the prelude. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for bringing us together this morning. Uh, for those that can make it um, and travel here safely, we thank you for those being able to attend. Uh, for those that aren't with us due to travel or sickness or other things, Lord, we just uh, pray your blessing over them as well, wherever they may be. Uh, we pray your hand over this service um, to those that are helping to lead it, to the work that they've put into it, um, to the work that will be done through it, Lord. And we just pray that um, we would uh, just know your presence and that this uh, service would um, lift you up. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you would please stand for our first hymn. Please join me in singing on page 601, Standing on the Promises.
You may be seated, and children, if you would come forward, Shelly Smeltzer has the story this morning. Okay. All right. Well, how many of you have ever made, is there more coming? Wait a minute, somebody. How many of you have ever made a tent at home or a fort? Yeah, they're so fun. One time, well, I have a home daycare and we made one that just took up the whole entire living room and that was really cool. It was a lot of fun and they're kind of comfy to hide in them, aren't they? Yeah, it's fun to hide. Now, today, I brought my tent with me, okay? This is one of the tents we play with at my house. And I think it's fun to get in there, too, especially with blankets and pillows. It's really comfy. Sometimes when I go in there, I don't always want to come out. I wish I had a good book and I could just stay in there all day and relax. That would be a fun thing to do. So this morning, I want to tell you that the Bible talks about God being our refuge. Do you know what that means? What's a refuge? A refuge is like a safe place to be, kind of like that tent. I'm using that tent to represent God being a refuge this morning, okay? Now, God is not that tent, okay? That's just a tent. But we're using that as an example. It's kind of like if you play tag. You guys all like to play tag, right? Freeze tag, any kind of tag? That's fun. You guys are really quiet this morning. <laughs> when you play tag, <clears throat> you, have to, you usually have a place where you're safe, or a home base, right? Yeah, how do you feel when you get to that home base? Yeah, you feel safe? Are you happy to be able to stop running and catch your breath? Because it's the only place you can stop, isn't it? Yeah, well, God is like our home base, okay? It's a place we can go, we can rest in him, and he will help us catch our breath, and we can find peace, and we can find calm. Now, <clears throat> In the book of Psalms, there's a verse that says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And that verse is from Psalm 46.1. Let's say it together. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. I memorized this verse years ago when I was in what's called Brethren Volunteer Service. You go away someplace for a whole year, and you serve God somewhere, and I worked as a a shelter counselor for people who were being hurt by other people, they were violent people. The shelter was a safe place for them. And I went through some difficult times while I was there. And so this verse means a lot to me. So I've had this verse memorized a long time. And then when I heard that Pastor um, Len was going to talk about God being our refuge, that verse just came right to my mind because it meant so lot to, a lot to me. So anytime you guys are nervous, or afraid, or maybe something happens that is difficult. Like maybe you broke something that belonged to your mom accidentally. That's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? Because you got to go to mom and say, Mom, I accidentally broke this. That's not a fun thing to do, is it? No. Or maybe somebody is not very nice to you at school. That can happen too. As Christians, there's going to be people out there in the world who are not going to be very nice to us but we still have to trust God, don't we? Yeah. Anytime a difficult situation happens in our life, we can always trust that God will be our refuge and our strength. He will always be your home base, no matter what. Okay? Now, I brought some music with me. We have Halloween coming up too, don't we? And sometimes some of us, sometimes kids can get kind of nervous at Halloween too because... They see all these pictures of ghosts and, and witches and things that aren't really real at all and people dressed up and sometimes we hear spooky, creepy music, which can be kind of fun for some of us and make some of us a little nervous. 
So remember, whenever you get scared, where can you go? To who? God, that's right. He is our refuge. We're going to pretend that today. I have some music. It's dinosaur stomping music. Now, we know that dinosaurs are not stomping around the earth right now, right? They're not going to crash into our church this morning. This is just pretend music, okay? So I'm going to put it on, and I'm going to let you guys go in my tent, two at a time. You can go in and look around, and then come out and sit back down, okay? All right, let me turn on my, my dinosaur music. See if I can get it going. Do you hear that? Okay. Oh, kind of creepy, isn't it, <laughs> Jacob? Yeah. All right, I'm going to let you guys go in, okay? Can I go in, I go in my tent? Yeah, you guys, all three can go in together. Yeah. Okay, come back out. Good job. Do you want to go in, Zachary? Go check it out. Go ahead. Jacob, you can go in, too. Wyatt, do you want to go in? <laughs> Getting bigger. Do you want to go, in? go ahead, kiss your brother. Yeah, both of you. I don't think Wyatt wants to come out either. It's pretty comfy in there. There's a pillow and a blanket. Okay, you got to come out. <laughs> okay, Drake boys. You guys want to go in? Do you want to check it out? You want to go in? You can go in. Go ahead. I'm not going to make you. But I want you to get to go in if you'd like to. <laughs> One of them said, it is comfy. <laughs> it is. Okay. All right. Now i got to see if I can get it shut off. <laughs> So I want you to remember from today, again, that whenever you're nervous or afraid or something just plain doesn't go your way, and sometimes that happens, we'll wake up and everything seems to go wrong some days. We can always go and find shelter in who? God. That's right. And I don't ever want you to forget it. So let's say this verse again because I know some of you can read, okay? So God is, say it really loud, God is our refuge and strength. An ever-present help in trouble, Psalm 46, 1. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, God, for these children. Thank you, God, for a beautiful, sunny, warm weekend. And thank you, God, for being an ever-present help in trouble. Thank you that we can go to you every day and take refuge in you and that we can feel um, peace, and feel your warmth and, and your arms around us. We thank you, Lord, so much for this. In your precious name, we all say, amen. Thanks, Shelley. You would please stand uh, for singing our next hymn, and we'll also have the tithes and offerings come in during this hymn as well. Please join me in singing on page 368, God Will Take Care of You.
morning to everyone. Uh, sometimes people ask, uh, how are you? And I guess I would have to say this morning, well enough. And I'm glad to be able to uh, share you know, God's word with you this morning. Uh, Pastor Stan asked me to take care of uh, prayer time in his absence. And uh, we have two uh, prayer updates to share. And of course, you know, the most important part about prayer is the prayer insert in your bulletin. I know what I do every week. I tear that off. You see? Put it in my pocket. And then I have a prayer folder at home. And every day I pray for these prayer concerns. And, and, and that, I think, is the most important part of prayer time, this insert. So I'd encourage you, if you don't use this prayer insert, tear it out. And you won't mind if you tear it, right? Okay? Use it every day. And then, of course, you know, we get different prayer updates uh, you know, through, throughout the week. Uh, the two special prayer updates to share, and I'm going to be very careful in what I say here. I'm going to read just as is written, okay? Uh, JC is in an undisclosed high-risk area. Pray for safety for JC and the others and peace for their families. And the second prayer announcement would be for uh, traveling mercies for everyone on fall break. Uh, especially the Godfreys, and do you know when they're returning from Pennsylvania? Tomorrow, okay, especially as they return from Pennsylvania. Some of you know we were not here last week because we had a few places to go and people to see. Uh, we traveled 500 plus miles to Pennsylvania to see mother-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and some others. And then it was another 400 plus miles. I conducted a funeral for another one of my uncles. This time it was in North Carolina, not in Georgia. And so then when we left there, let's see, what was over 600 miles? And uh, well, Teresa and I, we tried to pull an all-nighter, but we're just too old to pull an all-nighter. So, you know, we got up the road a while, and then uh, Teresa said, let's find a Walmart, let's find a Walmart. And so then we, we in our camper uh, van, you know, we slept about two hours in Walmart, but it was sort of noisy, it was raining, you know, this and that. So then we got up and we drove for a while, and then somewhere on, uh, let's see, was it 33? Yeah, west of Columbus on 33, we found a, a, a rest area, and slept about another two hours, and so it wasn't, it was an all-nighter, but we did rest, so appreciate your, your prayers. Let's look to the Lord together as we pray. As we begin our time of prayer this morning, Lord, we certainly want to praise you for the opportunity to assemble here and worship together. And we also thank you for all those who will, at this time or later on, be checking in with our service online. And as, as we praise you for the opportunity to openly worship you, may we remember Christians that have to worship secretly in places like Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in uh, North Korea, and uh, of course in, in Afghanistan. And we pray that they may be able to worship with, uh, in secret and yet still be able to hold forth the, the word of life to the people that they meet. Lord, we confess that uh, we're not worthy of all the great and wonderful gifts and all the provisions that you make for us, so I would like to ask uh, during a time of silence that we might confess to you any known or unknown sins. We thank you, Father, for, for listening to our prayers of confession. And we also thank you for the promise in your word that if we confess our sin, you are faithful, you are just to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We would like to thank you, Lord, for everyone who was able to contribute in any way to the offering today, not just the financial offering, 
But Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege as Christians to offer our thanks to you by how we use our time as well as our treasure and how we allow you to utilize our talents to your honor and to your glory. Lord, we'd like to uh, pray for people who may be ill. We don't have any people uh, to add in particular, but we know sometimes people experience various types of illness. It might be physical illness. It might be emotional illness. And we want to remember people who are in the hospital, under hospice care, or even people who are undergoing uh, rehab. We want to pray for people this coming week that may have tests, procedures, or surgeries. We want to uh, pray for Torin Eichler, our district minister. We know there are several churches in this district that have pastoral vacancies, and I pray that you might guide him as he might find uh, ministers that would match the needs of these various congregations. We pray for uh, people that serve us in uh, local, state, national government, uh, whether they are serving in legislatures, whether they are serving in executive positions, and we also want to pray for those who are serving in the judiciary, that they might make their decisions not based on what seems to be popular, but what might fall the precepts of the Word of God. We pray also, Lord, for uh, our adult Bible study, our WANA program, our youth program on, on Wednesday night. We want to pray for those who are serving our nation, both here and abroad. We pray for local first responders. We pray for those in law enforcement. And of course, we pray for missionaries. In many countries of the world, sometimes they can't go as a missionary, but they're allowed to go in some other capacity and then witness. And we pray that you might expedite that. And we know, especially this morning, brothers and sisters are living in nations that continue to be under crisis. I pray we'll remember those in Haiti, in Nigeria, and of course in, in Ukraine. And we also want to pause during this time of corporate prayer for each person to uh, share their unspoken request to you. With gratitude, we thank you for this time when we're able to pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Today I will be reading... Joshua chapter, seven, uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. If you're using your pew Bible, it's 227, and out of honor for God's word, if you could stand if you were able. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge, as I have instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When he flees to one of these cities, he is to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state his case before the elders of that city. Then they are to admit him into their city and give him a place to live with them. If the avenger of blood pursues him, they must not surrender the one accused because he killed his neighbor unintentionally and without malice aforethought. He is to stay in that city until he has stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then he may go back to his own home in the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. On the east side of the Jordan of Jericho, they designated Bezer in the desert on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth 
in Gilead, in the tribe of Gad, in Golan, in Bashan, in the tribe of Manasseh. Any of the Israelites or any alien living among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to those designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Thank you. You may be seated. I've entitled this message, Where is Your Refuge? And I was asking Brother Don when we were having prayer time before the service began this morning, I said, have you ever heard a Sunday morning message on Joshua chapter 20? And he indicated that he hadn't. So this might be a new experience for many of us this morning. Now, I'm going to ask a question, and I think I know the answer to this. How many of you have ever been to the Elkhart County Fair? How many have ever been to the Elkhart County Fair? You know, I'm seeing some people won't put their hands up. I mean, I thought everybody here has been to the Elkhart County Fair. As a young boy, I remember visiting county fairs. And of course, at county fairs, you have many different exhibits. And there's one exhibit that still leaves a lasting impression on my mind to this day. It was a civil defense exhibit back in the 1960s. And I know that's ancient times for some of us here, OK? American families were urged to look for a refuge, a shelter, or even build a personal fallout shelter at their homes to protect them from the effects of radiation after an atomic attack upon the United States by the Soviet Union. It was interesting. In fact, I was so taken by that that I saved the different things that were passed out at these shelters. There's a booklet, official US government booklet, survival under atomic attack. They passed out another one. In fact, if I remember, these were county fairs and they even passed these out in schools. Fallout protection, what to know and do about nuclear attack. And then for 10 cents, the United States government would send you, or you could pick these up at the county fairs, the family fallout shelter. And there were detailed architectural drawings of how you could build your shelter. Now, I know some of you are saying, ah, so much for the history lesson. That isn't anything that we worry about today. But last weekend, in the weekend edition of the Wall Street Journal, in section C. Ever see a photo? And that's not a movie photo, that's a real photo. And it says, how to keep the Ukraine conflict from going nuclear. This page, and then just look at this article. Very much in depth. So, a shelter. One thing that was interesting was they would display a two-week supply at these county fairs of food and water. And sometimes people would ask the question, what happens after two weeks when all the food and water is gone? But then, you know, young people, how many like chocolate? You can put up your hand. How many like chocolate in here? A lot of you like chocolate. Most people like chocolate. And I was amazed, you know, they would show us these Hershey chocolate bars. And they said, now make sure you have these in your shelter, in your refuge. And, and they said, you can keep them in there for years. But what we've discovered is that the chocolate turns white. But don't worry, it'll still taste like chocolate. Americans were attempting to prepare a refuge, a place of safety for personal protection against the effects of an atomic attack. Likewise, we see here in Joshua chapter 20, the Israelites were to prepare six cities of refuge, six safe havens in the event that an individual accidentally killed another person. These cities were protection against revenge killings 
for those who had caused accidental deaths. Could we put on the screen again Joshua chapter 20, verses 1 and 2? You see, we have to realize that murder was a very serious crime in the Old Testament. Exodus 20, 13, Deuteronomy 5, 17 tell us this. You see, the concept of blood vengeance could be traced back to Cain. And after Cain killed Abel, he really expected to be killed in revenge for the murder of his brother. You can read more about that in Genesis 4, verses 13 and 14. Now, you might be saying, okay, cities of refuge, so what? Guess what? There was no other civilization in the ancient Middle East that had this concept to have cities of refuge. The provision was to be made between murder and accidental killing, and of course, what do we call that today? We call it manslaughter, right? And also to grant the right of trial to suspected murderers. We have additional details about that in Numbers chapter 35, verses 6 to 34, and in Deuteronomy. And oh, by the way, Deuteronomy, that was Jesus' favorite book of the Old Testament. Christ quoted more from Deuteronomy than any other book. In Deuteronomy 19, 1 to 13, we also have this concept. Uh, Joshua chapter 20 and verse 3, if we could have that up now as well. In either case, if you accidentally killed somebody, all right, you had to leave your family, you had to leave your possessions, and you had to move immediately to a refuge city to avoid being killed by the deceased family or friends or relatives even before there was a trial. You see, at various times in Israel's history, the responsibility to avenge a murder fell to the victim's closest relative, and that closest relative was known as the avenger of blood. Joshua 20 and verse 4, if we could have that on the screen. You see, the city gates at that time controlled all the traffic in or out of these six cities of refuge. And normally at the city gates, of course, these gates would be closed at night. The, these uh, judges or elders, they didn't have to pull any all-nighters, okay? But normally they sat on these benches to adjudicate various types of cases. I know for many people, their favorite Old Testament book is the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, you find a very il illustration of these elders sitting before the gates in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. So, you've been accused of an accidental murder. You have to state your case before these elders since the refuge or sanctuary was not granted indiscriminately. The person was to be regarded as innocent until proven guilty. And according to Numbers chapter 35, verse 30, a minimum of two witnesses were required to condemn one accused of murder. Apparently, the elders of these cities of refuge not only had to admit the accused, give them a place to live, and I assume also a way to earn a living. Joshua 20 and now verse 5, please. Now, the goal of the trial was to determine if the killing was intentional or, in other words, without malice aforethought. And could we go to Joshua 20, verse 6? Notice that the protection from the avenger of blood was promised only so long as the accused lived in that city of refuge, according to Numbers 35, verses 26 to 28. Thus, even if one killed another accidentally, they were held responsible. They had to forfeit their freedom for a period of time. Now, how long did they have to stay in this city of refuge? Apparently, the sentences were ended by general amnesties that were declared whenever the current high priest in Jerusalem would die. Now, Joshua 27. Notice three of these six cities of refuge were located, and it's too bad I don't have a map here today, but we're going to do an imaginary map, okay? 
if we're gonna say, this is West Bank, this is East Bank, here's the Jordan River, the Dead Sea's down here, the Sea of Galilee is up there, all right? They were strategically located so that a person, whether they lived on the West Bank or the East Bank of the Jordan River, could have access to this refuge. The first one mentioned is Kadesh. It's in the north. The word Kadesh signifies holy. Think about it. Who lived the most holy life ever on this earth? It was Jesus, right? Jesus alone lived a holy, sinless life. And it's his desire today that his children still live. What does holy mean? It means set apart. It means a sanctified lifestyle. I know many of you help or you have helped in the Awana program. And uh, this year, Teresa and I and Sarah, we, are, we check the kids in to, to Awana. And one of the questions that we ask them, and I'm going to change how I, after, after preparing this sermon again, I'm going to change how I ask this question. We ask them a question, did you bring your Bible? And you know, I think that's a short way to say something that we really shouldn't say. I think we need to say, did you bring your holy Bible? Because, you know, the word Bible just means a collection of books. We have 66 books here, right? But this is a holy Bible. This is set apart. This is different than any other book available anywhere in the world. The next town of refuge was Shechem. Now it was farther south. It was in central Israel. And the word Shechem literally means the shoulder. Now, Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross, didn't he bear the sin of the entire world on his shoulders? And even today, Jesus wants to pick us up, carry us to a place of refuge because we know the only safe place is to be secure in Christ. Stay on the West Bank. We had Kadesh, Shechem, Hebron. Hebron's probably mentioned often, and sometimes you even hear about Hebrew, uh, Hebron in the news today because sometimes there are conflicts between the Palestinians and the Israelis there. And Hebron was found in the southern part of what today is referred to as the West Bank. And some of you might remember in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 to 14, it had been given to Caleb as a reward for his unfavoring faithfulness. Remember, Joshua and Caleb were the only people who were willing to move into the promised land. They weren't afraid of the giants, and the others were. Now, the word Hebron sometimes is interpreted to mean fellowship. But we must never forget that not only do we have fellowship with God the Father, fellowship with Jesus Christ, but we also have fellowship with each other through Christ as well. Joshua 20 and verse 8, please. We're going to shift now from the West Bank to the East Bank of the Jordan. And there were three cities of refuge in the area of Israel east of the Jordan River. Sometimes if you look at old maps, they'll call that Transjordan. But today, these are found in the modern nation of Jordan. And the listing in scripture this time starts from the south, okay? And it talks about Bezer. Now the term Bezer may be rendered a fortified place. Jesus Christ is a stronghold. He's a tower. He's a place of defense. And born again Christians who talk the talk and walk the walk want to run to Jesus when they have trouble to find a place of safety. 
You know, some people say one of the anthems of the Protestant Reformation was written by Martin Luther. And he wrote the well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. But you know, sometimes when we sing these hymns, we don't think about the words. I know we're supposed to. But the English translation, of course, Martin Luther wrote the music as well as the words. And he said, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. What's that mean? All kinds of troubles. You and I, we don't know what type of challenge we're going to face this coming week, right? For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. Who's that? That's Satan. It's the devil. He's alive and well. Martin Luther wrote, his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. You think there's more or less hate in the world today than there was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. There's more hate than ever. On earth is not his equal. Verse 3 is interesting. And though this world with devils filled, how many people are demon-possessed today? You can't, you can't even count it. Should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim. Again, who is that? It's Satan. We tremble not for him. His rage we can't endure, for though his doom is sure, one little word shall fail him. And of course, that's a word of God. The fourth verse, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth, the spirit and the gift are ours through him who with us sideth. That goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also, this body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. In the state of Indiana, I have run across a lot of towns that end with the word burg. Is there a Lawrenceburg, Indiana? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing that. But, but back in the state of Pennsylvania, where Teresa and I are from, we have all kinds of burgs, okay? We have like our state capital is called Harrisburg. We have the largest city in western Pennsylvania called Pittsburgh, okay? Uh, our address before we retired, moved to Indiana five years ago, was Mercersburg. What is this Berg business about? You see, Berg is an old English word for fort. There was a fort where Pittsburgh is today. It was named after a British PM, a prime minister by the name of William Pitt. Harrisburg was named after a Miss, Mr. Harris who had a ferry across the Susquehanna River. This past weekend, we visited my mother-in-law in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And there was a man by the name of Benjamin Chambers during the French and Indian War who had a mill. And he decided to build a stockade around his mill. And later on, that became Chambersburg where mother-in-law is. Jesus Christ, we have to remember, when we feel threatened, and if you witness, if you live for Christ, there are people who are going to threaten you. Jesus is our fort when we face danger. There's only one person that ever walked this earth that can honestly say, I have overcome the world. Remember, in the Bible, the word world is cosmos, it means the evil world system is not talking about the nature that we love. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, has overcome all the dangers, threats, troubles, and spiritual attacks that any of us may face. I know sometimes we feel sorry for ourselves. We say, oh, woe is me. I, this, I can't believe this is happening to me. There's nothing that ever happens to us that didn't happen first to Jesus Christ. 
Ramoth. Okay, moving up from the south, we're on the east bank, in the center. Ramoth in Gilead was the central city of refuge east of the Jordan. And the term Ramoth signifies exaltations. Certainly, Jesus Christ has been exalted. Jesus, he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus promises to exalt people who trust in him in due time. But what does it really mean to trust in Christ? Um, I changed my scripture a little bit this morning. I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 2, but I'm going to start with verse 5. I don't know if that's something that can be adjusted real quickly on the screen or not. Philippians chapter 2, or if you have your Bible open, open it, or if you don't have it open, okay? I'm going to start with verse 5. I was going to start with verse 12, okay? Philippians 2, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Boy, that's profound. Did you ever look at somebody and say, they need an attitude adjustment. Did you ever do that? Okay. But, you know, we are the ones, each one of us, I think every day, we need to have an attitude adjustment. Some of you know that I've attended probably most of the Church of the Brethren Annual Conferences since 1996. I've missed a few, you know, being in transition and this and that. But one thing that always irritates me is when I see people, they'll stand up at annual conference and they say, uh, well, we have a decision to make. We have to find the mind of Jesus Christ. And I almost feel like cringing a little bit because here's where I find the mind of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, I have never heard a person stand up at annual conference and say, we need to have the same attitude of Jesus Christ. Now, let's make it, let's go down to our level. Do sometimes in our local congregation, do we have a situation or a scenario where we don't have the attitude of Jesus Christ toward another brother or sister. Could that happen? Okay. Now, I just lost my chain of thought. Senior moment here. Attitude. Okay. Verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Now, what was his attitude? Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, that's a Christ-like attitude, right? Being a servant. Verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, Philippians 2.12. I think that was prepared ahead of time. Therefore, Remember when Pastor Stan preaches, and I'll do the same thing. You know, when you have the word therefore, you have to look back, okay? So we have Christ being exalted. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Whoa. Attitude? Look at this. Verse 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing 
so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. The inspired words of the Apostle Paul. Okay, leaving Ramoth, okay, exaltation. Now let's travel to the third city on the east bank, Golan. Now, Golan is often in the news because there was a war back in 1967 between Israel and Egypt and Jordan and Syria. And in fact, the Golan Heights was taken by the Israelis from the Syrians, and technically, Syria and Israel are still in the face of war. The word Golan may be translated as manifested. Jesus Christ made an earthly appearance in human flesh, right? He was manifested in human flesh to destroy the works of the devil. And on judgment day, Christ will again return to earth and heaven to manifest or to show himself a glorious, victorious manner. Now let's go to Joshua 20 and verse 9. If you look at this verse carefully, you see the word foreigner. In some translations, you'll find the word alien. Notice that these six cities of refuge were not only for the Hebrews, and this text seems to foreshadow the time when God was going to open the door of faith to Jew and Gentile alike. You know, Paul was inspired in the book of Ephesians to unfold a mystery. He taught that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, would be fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers of all the promises of Christ through the gospel. In the book of Colossians, Paul wrote about the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. The living Savior, Jesus Christ, wants to live in the hearts of everyone as the hope of glory. Now, one question I'd like us to think about together this morning is to what extent do we show the Lord Jesus how much we appreciate the spiritual inheritance he's given us? Why are we so backward and hesitant to claim what can be ours as we seek to live the abundant Christian life. You see, we too, and I'm talking about us as a congregation, I think we need to offer asylum to spiritual aliens in our neighborhood. You see what I'm talking about? Spiritual aliens, people that don't know Christ. You know, the Jews, they spent 400 years as slaves and aliens in Egypt, and then God called them out. And just as the Jews had to stand alone against pagan societies that all surrounded them, today we as individuals, as a congregation, we need to take a stand against the godless, secular humanism that surrounds us and seeks to infiltrate our minds today. We, like the ancient Jews in Joshua 29, you know, we can open our congregation just like they opened those cities of refuge to any person, regardless of their race, their ethnic background, their nationality. I hope that we can always welcome anyone who walks in this door as a seeker who wants to find the Lord Jesus Christ. These six cities of refuge, they were open. People knew how to get to them. And care was taken every year to remove any barriers or hindrances that would prevent a person's safe arrival to those cities of refuge. Now, I want us to think for a moment. Is there anything in our lives that would hinder a person or present a barrier to any person coming here to seek to know how to live and receive Christ? Another question I'd like us to think about. You know, I've said this before. It's been a, I appreciate the opportunity to be a guest speaker, not just here, but in many other churches in our district. Because, you know, if you're the guest speaker, you can't fire me. All you can do is say, we're not having him back. 
you know, you can say that. We're not having him back. We don't like what he said. You, I mean, you can say that, but you can't fire me, right? Okay. So think about as you relate to other people, whether they be people you've known or perfect strangers, okay, are you building bridges or are you burning bridges with other people? You know, many scholars believe that allegorically, these six cities of refuge that we looked at here in the book of Joshua share some of the characteristics of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, right, and his bride, the church. You see, Jesus is still a refuge for sinners who will come to him. And the New Testament commands us, and I think the Apostle Paul's life is a good illustration of how to remove all impediments or anything that would hinder a person wanting to seek Christ. And we know that although Jesus has received hundreds of millions of repentant sinners, there's still room at the cross for more. As I was studying for this message, I thought about this song. And you know what? It's, it's a fairly recent song. It wasn't written until 1946. I know some of you say, oh, that's old. No. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. A, a wonderful, a wonderful hymn. The Refuge, the Haven, the Shelter. And uh, I guess I didn't expect to see Mickey Mouse here this morning, but the shelter is labeled there, God. Okay, I want everybody to understand the shelter is God. Not, not Mickey. Nothing against Mickey. He, he's okay. All right. Now, the shelter we can find in Jesus Christ is far superior to any of the six cities of refuge. Three on the west bank, three on the east bank. Teresa and I went to Messiah College in central Pennsylvania. In fact, that's where we met. And I was trying to think, it was in 70, 71, can't remember exactly the, the year, I was on a group called the Gospel Team. And the Gospel Team, sometimes we were supposed to go out to minister, like to sing, but sometimes we got ministered too. And I remember sometimes I would drive the van back where they had, I don't, are 16 passenger vans still legal or late illegal? Anybody have the answer to that? At one, one time, 15, oh, they're still legal? Okay, but I guess they used to be 16, and somehow they're not legal anymore. But I'd be driving the van to these events, and I remember one time we, we drove a considerable distance, ah, probably maybe 40 miles one way or something like that, to attend a worship service conducted by a Teen Challenge near Lebanon, Pennsylvania, among recovering drug addicts. And it wasn't like our worship service, I mean, I don't know. Vera, where's your tambourine? I don't, I don't see Vera. Vera didn't bring her tambourine. Teresa, you, she didn't bring a tambourine this morning. I mean, this worship service had a lot of movement into it. But these recovering drug addicts, I'll never forget this chorus they sang. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Oh, tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, oh, where could I go, seeking peace and refuge for my soul? I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Oh, tell me, where could I go but to the Lord? You think they sang that once, twice, three times, four times? They sang it, and they sang it. So where is our refuge? Where can we go? Where can we flee? Do we want to live a holy life in Kadesh? Do we want the Lord to carry us to Shechem on his strong shoulders? 
We want to enjoy fellowship with Jesus and his brothers and sisters in Hebrew. We want to live within God's mighty fortress in Bezer. We want to exalt Jesus Christ in our lives in Ramoth. Do we want to manifest the love and life of Christ in Gola? And my prayer for us today is that each of us would find our perfect and complete refuge through an ongoing, deeper, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you stand as we turn to number seven, a shelter in the time of storm? Many of you know my tradition is to always read scripture as a benediction. So I've chosen Psalm 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And all God's people agreed, saying... Amen.